Yo, yo, yo. We're back again, the horsemen. And um, Sam, I'm here with Tom. Ricky. Chang. Hello. And we are here to talk about the part two of the group project. And basically, we're gonna discuss four strategies instead of three, because there's four of us in the group. We're gonna discuss four strategies we'd like teachers to adopt to deal better with struggling students, as well as four strategies we'd like parents to adopt to deal with struggling students. So I'll go first. Um, my strategy is the implementation of individualized learning plans. And these are good for students with like ADHD, autism, learning disorders, or whichever, even if they're just struggling in school for another reason. And these plans are tailored to each student for a unique learning style and to satisfy their needs. So how it does this is there's customized learning and the plan is designed to keep them in keep in mind the student's strengths, weaknesses, interests, and learning style. This approach promotes active learning as a teacher teaching method aligns with the student's learning style. For instance, some children might be visual learners while others might be auditory instructions are more effective for them. Some may need hands-on approach to grasp concepts effectively. Like for a student with ADHD, it might be helpful to break down tasks into smaller manageable parts, while students with autism, visual aids, and concrete examples might be more beneficial. Um, it also has personal goals and progress tracking. The plan sets personal academic and behavioral goals for the students, which can be tracked over time. This helps promote motivation and self-confidence in the students as the students can see their progress. For example, a student with a learning disorder like Sandra may struggle with reading or understanding uh, concepts, and a specific goal could be to improve her reading fluency or to improve the depth at which she understands concepts rather than just, than just surface level. Um, third way it works is accommodations and modifications. So the ILP, the Individualized Learning Plan, includes necessary accommodations and modifications in the regular curriculum to support the learning needs of the student. For example, extra time for a test taken, preferred seating arrangements, using assistive technology or modified assignments can be in the plan. This ensures that students can participate in the learning process effectively without being overwhelmed. At my high school, when when like back when I was in high school, of course, there was like this was actually commonly used. Like when we had diploma exams or any exam actually, um, at, at the end of the school year, the students with with whatever they had, they would um have an extra like three hours on top of the overall plan, to uh, on top of the overall time that the other students had, they would have the extra time, and it would help with the struggles that they were going through, and IOP are also great because they don't they don't they don't cost extra money like maybe a little bit right just to focus on the student but it's not something that is un unachievable money wise to implement so like for teachers who want to learn more there's a resource called teacher vision um this is going to be linked in the description actually so you can check that out and it provides valuable tips for teachers on how to incorporate students with exceptionalities into their classrooms and this includes students who have superior intelligence this includes students who have learning disabilities or speech or language impairments, the students with sensory, like, and visual disabilities, students with behavioral disabilities, students with physical or orthopedic and mobility disabilities, and also students that have a combination of conditions such as orthopedically challenged and visually impaired. This resource is particularly valuable for teachers, new teachers, and it's applicable for all grades from kindergarten to grade 12. Um, so uh, for parents, a strategy that could be used is establishing a structured routine at home. Like developing a consistent and structured routine at home can be particularly beneficial for children with exceptionality. This strategy <clears throat> helps to reduce anxiety and enables the child to understand what to expect and what's expected for them. So. In order to do this, you need a consistent daily schedule 
create like a schedule for your child that includes time for school, homework, meals, playtime, hanging out with friends, sleep, all that. And you stick to this routine, like obviously not perfectly, but like, you know, there's room to adjust. And this can help children feel more secure and it can have can also help with managing tasks and responsibility. For example, a child with ADHD might have designated times for homework completion with short breaks in between to, you know, maybe watch TV or whatever they want to do. Um, you can also make like visual timelines and charts like that, like the visual aid, aid can help the child understand how to follow the routine. For example, a visual schedule with like pictures can be used for young, younger children or those who struggle with reading. You can also use a visual timer to show how much time is left for a task. Although sometimes that might be, not be the best idea, it depends on the kid. This can especially be helpful for children with autism who may struggle with transitions. Um, you also need to prepare the child for the routine by discussing with them at the start of the day and remind them like for the upcoming events before they actually come. At the end of the day, review the routine and then provide positive feedback on what they did well and discuss areas for improvement. This reflection can help your child understand their achievements and areas of growth. Me as a Nigerian, like my parents were very strict growing up. They're still strict to this day, actually. Like when I go back home, like for vacation, like not even like it's not even like vacation, but like I can't even go outside. But let me not get off on a tangent. What I mean is that Although I, I don't have any exceptionalities that I know of, even back home, I still had, like my parents had a really structured routine. Like, so it really helped me when I'd be struggling with, with school and it helped me stay focused and stay on task. So as a kid, you're kind of all over the place and it's really good to have the structure in the household. Um, a good resource for the parents with, um, if they have children with exceptionalities, like that I found, is the National Resource Center on ADHD. And this is actually a really good one. It's, this is also linked in the description, by the way. And it's basically a nonprofit organization that provides information, resources, community support, education, and advocacy for people with ADHD in their, in their families. It offers extensive information about ADHD, hosts support groups, provides educational webinars and courses, advocates for better policies and delivers a weekly newsletter with recent news and research about ADHD. So that is there for parents who have more questions than they have children with ADHD. Um, although implementing individualized, implementing individualized learning plans or structured routines at home can be very beneficial to, for children across cultures and marginalized groups. However, it is important to note that what the one size fits all approach might not always work. The implementation of these strategies should always consider cultural, social, economic, and linguistic factors. Like a culture, like for cultural factors, certain cultures might have different beliefs, values, and practices. So, it might like one strategy might not work for them. There might be adjustments that need to be made to ensure that interventions are culturally sensitive and respect the child's background, and like for like in school for teachers like there's also linguistic factors so like language can be a barrier for parents who are not fluent in the language used at the child's school so this might make it more difficult for them to collaborate effectively with the teachers and creating an implemented like learning plan or routine so that is also another factor to keep in mind yeah that's that's my strategies yeah, a few things i want to add to, uh, about yours, uh, the about the individualized learning plans, even if they do cost, if the student has a diagnosis for an exceptionality, uh, the school will get additional funding, which can help with alleviate the cost for uh, the individualized learning plans. And also for your um, case study student, Sandra, I think she had, she also had like severe LD too. So what do you think? Um, your recommendations to the teachers and parents help with uh, helping Sandra? Um, yeah, so um, Sandra's main problem was like, she was good at like memorization and stuff like that. It's just that 
when it came to really understanding the concepts, uh, like she she couldn't get that. So I think for her specifically, like a method of like tutoring or something along those lines to really go in depth about explaining the concepts. Because in class, you know, it's just general, like they don't really explain the concepts that well for like each student. So like some kind of one-on-one -on -one tutoring would be really beneficial for her. Mm, I agree. Okay, following on that, I'll give my suggestions about what teachers and parents should do. So for teachers, I would say the most important thing is to ensure there's regular communication between them and the uh, parents, right? Because oh, maintaining an open and frequent form of communication to talk about the uh, student's progress throughout the school year uh, can help identify any early signs of struggle or challenge. This is, though it's a communication between teacher and parent, I feel like the responsibility mainly falls on that of the teachers because they are the one that are, you know, in charge of the student when it's in class, when the parents are not there. So ensuring that they're constantly talking with each other about any issues that arise, any problems, any concerns, right, can help notify the parents and uh, help take steps towards alleviating the problem and identifying any exceptionalities if they are to be present. And teachers can learn more about uh, whether students uh, showing symptoms of exceptionalities from the uh, one of the websites we've put down below called LD Online, which tells them uh, common symptoms and strategies to help um, identify and on the certain symptoms and help how they can help alleviate those in the class setting. The next we have uh, my suggestion to the parents be sure that their children have a healthy lifestyle so ensuring they have proper exercise diet and like sleep uh, for, for example like raymond from the student i analyzed last time he was uh later diagnosed with adhd and is known that uh, people with adhd uh, have a negative reaction with like sugar and like caffeine and because that will just uh exacerbate their symptoms making them even harder to focus and do well in class so by you know controlling one's diet to meet their needs will help greatly in uh, their class setting so stuff more about like how a diet affects you can be seen down below in the drake institute link i've put down there and then of course we all know that diet greatly changes the way you your mood your, the way you perceive a certain topics and just your overall energy throughout the day. And then of course, of course uh, having a healthy diet is very uh, objective, right? Certain cultures and beliefs have different ideas of what a healthy diet is. But generally, I would say the science has proven that more uh, you know, nutritious whole foods are more uh, beneficial to the development of children uh, than you know, processed foods and snacks and candy. But of course, uh, ensuring that these foods are healthy could, uh, you know, require more of a financial uh, burden, but it's not to an extent of a task that it's an unachievable financial burden. And then you can see more about what constitutes uh, here in the West as a healthy diet down below from the sites of like Harvard uh, Nutrition Source and the Mayo Clinic for Healthy Children Diets. I have a question for the, um, uh, the communication between parents and teachers. So hmm. you said that uh, consistent communication between parents and teachers will help with an early diagnosis of their problem, right? Uh, do, mm -hmm. you mean, do you mean like early in the school year or early in the child's like education? Uh, both, right? Because Early in the school year would mean early in their education, right? Because if the teacher already sees symptoms like a week into class, hmm. if there's if they just tell the parents immediately, you know, the parents can decide what they want to do moving forward. And if they believe that their child has any exceptionalities, they can get, go get tested and take the appropriate steps rather than having to wait through maybe like the entire semester before they get like the report cards back and where the teacher tells the on the comments like, He's been having these issues for the entire school year. I see. That makes sense. All right. Um, Ricky, I got a question for you, actually. Uh, 
Does this any of this relate to you personally? Uh, personally, well, communication, more and more about diet. Because for me, if you have a healthy diet, you just feel better, right, throughout the day. And ensuring that these children also have a proper balanced diet make will not only make them feel better, but will make them focus more in class and just have overall more energy, right? And that will directly translate to their uh, performance in class. And this is irregardless of whether they have exceptionalities or not. Just in ensuring a proper diet, proper sleep, you know, proper exercise is just an overall ensuring overall well being of the of the students. Actually, I feel like all of us have the the connection to to what Ricky is saying. Like, uh, like you and Sam, we're both like um, like go to the gym, right? And we we are right now in the summer. We're like lowering our calorie count for cutting, like l reducing our body fat, and we eat so much less than what we usually eat in the school year. And I feel like that, I mean, all of you have experienced this, like all, like in the morning, I have no energy to do any studying at all. Like I get to, to school to, to study for the MCAT with you guys at night. Like all of us are always complaining that we're always so hungry and we can't focus on the, on schoolwork. So I feel like being malnourished and not having the, uh, enough nutrition to be able to focus on, uh, like school tasks is a very big, issue that many parents have to address and be sure that they they meet the child's nutrition criteria yeah yeah definitely because if you don't have the proper nutrients you just you just feel slow you yeah. know mentally and physically you, you just don't have the energy or the like the, the will to even just like do anything so you get out of bed even so ensuring a proper diet will just make them feel so much better mm -hmm. oh thank you ricky my recommendation for teachers is um, differentiated instruction. So this approach involves tailoring instruction to meet individual needs. Whether through flexible grouping or individualized instruction plans, teachers can modify their instruction based on a student's learning style, interest, and readiness level. Sorry, readiness level. Differentiated instruction can include changes in content, process, product, or the learning environment to better meet the students' needs and boost their academic ex success. It's a, it's a teaching philosophy based on the premise that students learn best when the teachers accommodate the differences in their learning styles, interests, and abilities. Some key components of differentiated instruction are content differentiation. So this involves changing what students learn and what the teachers give out to the students. For example, teachers can give students different tests, different texts at varying reading levels or modify the complexity of the content to match the readiness and learning preferences of each student. It also includes process differentiation. This involves changing how students acquire information and teachers can use flexible grouping, which allows students to work in differently mixed groups depending on the goal of the instruction. They can also use a variety of instructional strategies, such as lectures, discussions, problem-based learning, and technology-enhanced instruction to cater to different learning styles. Uh, it also includes product differentiation, so which involves changing how students demonstrate what they have learned instead of requiring all students to express their learning in the same way. Uh, teachers can allow students to choose how to represent their knowledge and skills. For example, a student might choose to write a report, create a graphic, or give a, a presentation. And learning environment differentiation. It involves changing where and with whom students learn. Teachers can create spaces in the classroom for quiet individual work, partner work, or group work. They can also vary the noise level, lighting, and seating arrangement to cater to students varying their sensory needs. Differentiated instruction requires ongoing assessment to understand students' needs, strengths, and areas of growth. It also requires flexibility and creativity on the part of the teacher. The goal is to create a supportive learning environment where all students can succeed. So a few of these things we've learned in class, uh, such as like the content differentiation and product differentiation, like how 
uh, how teachers vary their teaching methods and how, uh, like for example, in class, when Kathy allows us to use different formats to submit our assignments, that's uh, product differentiation, differentiation too. And something like, um, like flexible grouping, I, I feel like that's a lot similar to what we learned about like gifted children, how when we ha put gifted children into groups of with other gifted children, it is more focused on their the individual um, like skill and individual like learning, whereas we put gifted children into groups with uh, like varying skill levels, it's more of a group learning and allowing them to build their social skills, which we learned in class uh, this week. Uh, a resource for differentiated instruction is like Khan Academy, where students, if they feel like they are lacking behind with their classmates on like their the progress in their education, they can go on Khan Academy and they can use that to further their um, progress and also have different ways to support their learning. A some a intervention for parents with struggling children in school is to encourage positive learning environment at home. So they can create a quiet, comfortable space for their child to study and do homework. This space should be free of distractions and have all the necessary supplies. Encourage they can encourage their child to ask questions and express their thoughts about what they're learning. Uh, parents should show interest in this child's schoolwork and celebrate their academic achievements, no matter how small. Uh, something like a, a resource for parents is understood.org, which is an, a website that offers resources specifically designed for parents of children with learning and attention issues. It provides information about different types of learning difficulties, offers advice on advocating for your, for their child, and shares practical tips for helping child children at home. Yeah, I'll be talking about uh, my strategies. No, uh, so my strategy uh, is inclusion which Kathy is executing amazingly. And it also kind of correlates to what my friends have discussed as well, with my colleagues right here. So um, every student expresses themselves in different ways and they are creative in different ways. Some student might not be able to succeed with the traditional education system, but by allowing them to have more freedom, such as doing assignments in different formats, um, it would allow the students to excel exponentially. For example, the video recording that we're doing right now for EPSE. And another example would be when I was in middle school, there was a socials class assignment on castles or something. And the teacher allowed us to do the assignment on Minecraft. So a few students, including myself, all hopped on a server, built a castle together, creating more bonding time and social interaction. More than just sim simply sitting in a desk and writing a paper. <clears throat> a useful site which uh, would also be included in our description is uh, readingrockets.org, where it talks about ways to include children with difficulties in different ways, such as verbal expression, written expression, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And a strategy for the parents would be to make sure that they have a good IEP team. The, I the IEP team is basically all the support a parent would get and ensuring that everyone on the team is on the same page with the same goal is necessary for the child and the parent. I remember the first guest speaker who came in and how she talked about how helpful, helpful her IEP counselor was. When she saw that a change was required in her IEP plan, she would go and request it, and the counselor would always try her best to fulfill her request, making sure that both her and her child are getting the support that they need. Um, I don't think the parents have the privilege to choose who is on the IEP team, but a resource that allows the parents to create a more effective and cohesive IEP team will also 
be in the description. Do you have any uh, connections that you made while making the the implementations for your case study soon? Oh, good question. So, um, for Alan, uh, he was not diagnosed with anything. He did not qualify for learning disabilities or anything. So I think by allowing inclusion, because according to the report, Alan found history and science boring. That's why he was not being able to succeed. So I believe by alternating the forms of teaching or even how the assignments are done could very much so increase Alan's performance in these two areas. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. It's uh, my case I assume was also in a similar boat. Uh, Kevin did not qualify for any uh, LDs and he did not have any diagnosis for any exceptionality. So I feel like um, it was just a, a not a learning disability problem, but more of a teaching problem and a learning problem. So differentiating mm -hmm. like how the content is being taught, like you said, uh, would help a lot with their engagement and their inclusion into the classes activities and help with their performance Absolutely. as well. Yeah. Sure, yeah, sure. Um, Yo, Chang, or, yeah. or Tom, either one. Uh, how does like your strategy um, affect like other cultures or like marginalized groups? Uh, for my, um, for my implementation, for my interventions for um, the teachers and parents. In pertaining to other cultures, I feel like um, my like the the differentiating the the way that content is being taught. I feel like that uh, helps with including other cultures into um into the the way of learning because like we learned last week with the the reflection um indigenous ways of learning are very hands-on and they prioritize more of teaching the heart instead of teaching the mind and i feel like that fits a lot with what i'm saying like we have to give examples for our students we have to give them ways that they can implement their learning instead of just telling them the course material, just like reading through the notes, we should have activities or like um, assignments that engage what they have learned and have them apply their knowledge in ways that they have not done before. So I feel like that fits in a lot with uh, the indigenous ways of learning. And also, um, the resource that I gave for, for struggling students, like Khan Academy, that has no cost at all. It's a free uh, resource for students who are struggling. So I feel like uh, for like students of low income families, that is a very big uh, like piece of help for, for them to be able to have this like tutoring like app that is completely free. How about you, Chen? Well, my strategy is inclusion. So, got to include every culture, everybody, their preferences. Just like how yesterday in class, some people were, some people wanted an extension. Some people didn't feel happy about it. And Big Mama Bear, you know, found the middle ground and made sure everybody was okay with how everything was proceeding. And that is very important, I think, making sure everybody is included understanding where they're coming from and just respecting it basically yeah. it, it goes along for the iep team as well like if there's some cultural things that the parents don't feel like it's okay the iep team should most definitely should respect it and find alternate ways of achieving the same goal all right do you guys have anything else to add that about wraps up our last group project uh, it's been a long journey, guys. Uh, thank you, Kathy, for um, being so nice and being such a good lecturer. I feel like I've learned a lot through these three uh, few weeks. 
But I hope I see you again on campus. And I'll catch you guys around sometime soon. Peace. Yes, sir.